Hi everyone, welcome to Site Talks. Today we're here with Carol Shoemate again, and we're here to discuss ESFP and ESTPs who are with ISTJs as couples. And so Carol and I, both of our parents are ESFP and ISTJ, so we have intimate experience with this that we'll be sharing with you. But Carol also has worked with or has known a couple that is ISTJ and ESTP that will elucidate a lot of the interesting patterns you'll see within these relationships in terms of type. So I'll let you take it away. Okay, well, we were talking about our parents and my um. It turns out my father's ISTJ like yours and my mother's ESFP preferences like yours. And um, I remember when I was a child, they had a lot of, you know, my mother wanted to go out and party and, you know, she wants a variety in her life. And my dad wants to be at home and, you know, wants everything in control. So um, I think that, uh, whenever challenges come to us in life, it's an opportunity for individuation. And they were, my parents were certainly challenged uh, because they were in the uh, depression era and survival was an issue. And then um, a tragedy occurred in our family, which is that my older brother, when he was 13, he went on a Boy Scout trip and they went swimming and the water they swam in must have been contaminated. He got an ear infection. The infection went to his brain and he died. And it's the sort of thing that should not happen with you know, modern medicine and antibiotics. Um, so it was just a, a terrible tragedy. Um, but when these things happen, um, there is always an opportunity for growth. And there is a way in which this turned out to be, I don't know if I can say a blessing for all of us, but somehow my parents and their friends were able to help turn it into a blessing. And I think it really helps to have friends and to have community. One of the things I appreciate about you, Joyce, very much is that you are creating this wonderful community online. And we don't get enough community life in North America. We're just not, we don't have the kind of community closeness that Asian countries have and European countries have and African countries. You know, we just don't, don't have it. And so you're creating one, which is great. So anyway, my parents' friends helped them through this. And oh, a, an important part of this is that we lived in a terrible part of the world. I don't want to alienate anybody, but um, whenever I meet somebody from my hometown of Odessa, Texas, we have an immediate bond. Oh, you escaped, you know, <laughs> because it's very flat, very isolated, very dry. Um, and uh, of course there's opportunity there to create something. I don't wanna completely put it down, but in those days it was really pretty hard to eke out a living. And uh, my father being an ISTJ was such a, so wedded to home and you know, ISTJs don't like change. They don't like to move around a lot. His friends saw to it that he got an incredible promotion and eventually he took a job uh, that was headquartered in New York. And this job had him traveling all over the world, flying nonstop around the world. It was very exciting for him, um, but very challenging because that took him to his inferior function, which is extroverted intuition, you know? That's very uh, contradictory to introverted sensing. But if we can learn to use our dominant function and our inferior function together, the most amazing creativity can ensue from that. So we were able to leave this part of West Texas and to move to New York and Connecticut and uh, have a very different lifestyle there a very different life and uh, a much bigger 
life, I will say. It was an enrichment for all of us. But the only reason that he was able to do that, I think, is because um, every part of our town, you know, we spent a while in that town moving from house to house uh, just to get away from the memory of my brother. But, I mean, you know, it, there was still every part of the town, every place you go, you know, there was the memory, there was a memory of my brother there. So really they almost had to leave to completely break the hold of the grief on them. And so that's why it became a blessing. Do you wanna say something about your parents? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I, I'm, I'm sorry about the whole tragedy that happened. It seems like it was a huge development in helping you understand the dynamic between your family and the A function model too. So with my parents, there's an interesting dynamic. And so I think ESFPs and ISTJs can be very attracted to each other at the beginning. Like there are so many couples who are of this personality type together. I think when they get into a long-term relationship, they start to notice a lot of differences between them. Like the ESFP, like you said, loves variety, new experiences. So they're going out living life. And the ISTJ is usually wanting to stay within the routine or having known or predictable or reliable experiences. And so what can happen is an ESFP might be seen as changing their mind to at the last minute for an ISTJ because ISTJs need that time to let it sink in. Yes. Um, yeah. Uh, Carol Linden, the other Carol, actually told me that with ISTJs uh, or with with stabilizer SJ types, you kind of just need to tell them the change that you're making and then run away. They call it the hit and run <laughs> <laughs> so that they don't get upset in front of you. And I feel like... When my mom would tell my dad a last minute change or a, a last minute suggestion, my dad would not deal with the change that well. Mm -hmm. And so he, mm -hmm. he would get grumpy and then voice his grumpiness out loud. And then the ESFP might see it as being a downer in the situation or a wet blanket. And so it takes away from their fun. So I, I noticed there's that dynamic. ESFP is like those quick actions that give you an immediate result. And so like sometimes if there was a really cute cat and she wanted to buy my mother, the ESFP wanted to buy a cute cat and it was a deal, it, it really, it really appealed to her. And so she'd be like, I bought two cats and then doesn't tell anyone, oh, hey, look, there are two cats at home. Or like, hey, with the extroverted sensing, she notices that the house needs new roofing because her eyes notice that mm -hmm. um, it's actually getting old and you have to replace it. Mm -hmm. so she'll be like okay what's a way that I can immediately resolve this and so she'll be like oh I'm, I'm just gonna hire this like steel roofing company to do this whereas my ISTJ dad needs time to sit with a new decision and so he's <laughs> like wow that was really quick we're just like renovating the roof now I guess <laughs> <laughs> and and so it it's this whole change and stability that you'll see the difference of these two types valuing different things and so they can really work this out as in like communication can help solve it or it can turn into this realm of judging the other person for not being like how you're like. ESFPs might be a little bit forgetful at times. Like my mother historically throughout her entire life has had to find her car keys every single day. So because she puts it in a different spot every single day, like one moment it's on the counter and the one moment it's in her jacket pocket. And so with an ISTJ, they can either learn to love that and accept that about their partner, or they can end up complaining about that. It's like, well, mm -hmm. why don't you just put your car keys in the same place and so that you'll never lose it? And so that it can result in this parental dynamic at times, mm -hmm. or it can result in an acceptance and a love of the other person and, and better communication. So there's a lot of that. Um, and another point is... An ESFP who's with an ISTJ long-term, a possible conflict that could arise is the ISTJ could be seen as slow or making decisions slowly or doing things slowly. Mm -hmm. And the ESFP is like, why can't you act fast like me? Right. <laughs> yeah. right. So. Very mm -hmm. true. Very true. Very it, it goes back to the topic of projection that you mentioned earlier, that we all project ourselves onto other people. 
Yeah, and so we think they're like us. We think they're, you know, and we ask why aren't they like us? <laughs> Until we get to know them a little bit better. And then, you know, eventually in a long-term relationship, I at first you're attracted to things that are different. And then you reach a point where you, the things that are different just drive you crazy. But then you come back eventually to that earlier thing where you, you really, all the things that you, dis, all the problems that you see in your partner, you suddenly, you start to feel very tender about them and you want to protect that vulnerability in them and you actually cherish the parts of them that are inferior. It's, it's a really interesting thing that happens in relationships and it's very, uh, very sweet. <laughs> um, so yeah. the, the part, the thing that I wanted to, the relationship I wanted to talk about, it's actually a film relationship um, because it illustrates the type, the ISTJ type, especially really well, the ESTP type, it illustrates that well too, but I, I'm not sure they picked the right person for the, <laughs> for the acting. But um, the film is a really old one. It's uh, The Accidental Tourist with William Hurt as the main character. And this has, uh, I suppose part of my interest in the film is that um, in addition to being an ISTJ father, he's an ISTJ father whose son has died and his marriage breaks up, which actually happens fairly often when a child dies. And so um, when in the first part of the film, what's really happening is um, he's starting, his dominant function is starting to degrade. It is starting to, he's not able to take care of it. You know, introverted sensing um, with this, it's this memory function, you know, it, it, it guards all of our memories. Um, it's the worst function in the world to have in the hero position if you're in grief, because it is up until that point the memory function is responsible for all of the best things in your life. You know, ISTJs always have pictures of their family and mementos around them. And ISTJs say that all they have to do is look at the picture to re-experience the emotion they had at the moment that picture was taken. And so, um, but then when you're in grief, uh, every memory is crushing you. So what happens is that the personality really needs to develop other functions than just introverted sensation. So in the clip that I'm going to show you, actually, for the first time, um, this character is starting to develop his second function. I mean, he he had it earlier, I'm sure, but it's it's probably, he's just so deep in grief, he can't get out of introverted sensing memories in the first part of the film. But what happens, interestingly, is he starts to have, um, his body starts to break down his health. And that's a, a kind of symbolic of introverted sensing also, which is the guardian of the health. So he breaks his leg and you know, things are happening to him that just never happened before, but it's almost like Psyche is preparing him for the new thing. And the new thing is that inferior function, extroverted intuition, which he has mostly suppressed in his life because even his work, his work is traveling to, um, he writes guidebooks for, for businessmen who have to travel and hate traveling. So he's basically telling them how to take your own home and reinsert it in every new town you have to go to <laughs> and how to avoid um, anything new or different. <laughs> so that's what he writes books about. You know, that's his, uh, that's his uh, profession. So I'm gonna do a screen share and show you this point. He meets 
a woman who's an ESTP extroverted sensing and um, just sort of miraculously, although he's very repulsed by her at first, something happens that sort of breaks both of them out of their mold. And um, he is able to tell her about this tragic thing that happened. And uh, it's a very beautiful and moving scene. So then they're in relationship. And so now they're having the first argument in their relationship. And if you know about relationships, you know that that's a really positive sign. The first argument is really good. It means you know each other well enough to be honest. You trust each other well enough to speak your truth you know? And um, so if a couple can survive that first argument, they can um, deepen the relationship. So what I want to show you here, because it's just an illustration of how couples can argue. So I'll do a screen here. Let's see. So here you have the functions and um, the um, argument I'll I'll play the argument in just a minute. Um, here's the argument. The ESTP has a history. They both have a history. He's divorced um, and she um, is divorced. And she had a child when she was a teenager, probably. So she has a child from her previous, I'm not even sure she was married. Um, it's not clear um, and typical uh, extroverted sensing teenager, she wasn't thinking about consequences when she was a teenager. She was just living life. And she says that, you know, she says it wasn't planned. So her son's name is Alexander. And that's who he's talking about here. He begins to, to mention Alexander. And this is the first time we see him actually using parental energy, using his auxiliary function since his tragedy. I don't think Alexander's getting a proper education. Oh, no, he's okay. I asked him to figure what change they'd give back when we bought the milk today. He didn't have the faintest idea. He didn't even know he'd have to subtract. Oh, he's only in second grade. I think you ought to switch to a private school. Private schools cost money. So I'll pay. What do you say? Pardon? What are you saying, Megan? Are you saying you're committed? Well, that's not really the point. Alexander's got 10 more years of school ahead of him. Are you saying you'll be around for all 10 years? I can't just put him in a private school and take him out again on every passing whim of yours. Just tell me this. Do you picture us getting married sometime? I mean, when your divorce comes through? You real? Marriage is... I don't know. You don't, do you? You don't know what you want. One minute you like me and the next you don't. One minute you're ashamed to be seen with me and the next you think I'm the best thing that ever happened to you. You think you can just go along like this? No plans. Maybe tomorrow you'll be here, maybe you won't. Maybe you'll just go on back to Sarah. All I'm saying is... All I'm saying is, take care of what you promised my son. Go making him any promises you don't intend to keep. But I just wanted to learn how to subtract. I I love that. It always makes me laugh. I just wanted to learn how to subtract. You know, you can see people. I've I've seen these arguments, and I've been in them myself. Where you know, my husband's looking at me like, "Why are you so upset?" <laughs> um. So, if we analyze this using the eight function model, it really shows us what is happening here. So he's starting out with this lovely parental energy. He's for the first time really doing something sweet, which he is considering her son, you know, he's being parental towards her son and this ought to be well received. But let's look at the functions involved. Um, he's being parental, he's being a good parent and he's trying to organize the external world for her. But she has extroverted thinking in the which ESTPs don't like to have people organizing things for them. They can feel tyrannized by that. 
also, the witch is down in the unconscious. So when he first says this, I mean, the response is just silence. So what does he do? He doubles down. He tries again. He says he can't subtract. Now, what are numbers? Which function governs the numbers function? It's, it's introverted sensing, which is a sequencing function. Um, this is why people, so many people in finance uh, have ISTJ uh, preferences. And, um, but where does she have introverted sensing? It's in shadow for her in the opposing personality, which is an archetype that is very negative. It responds negatively. And so you always hear a lot of negatives in response. I use this icon to symbolize it. And so he tries again, she's still silent. He tries again. He says, you should switch to a private school. He's being really directive now, but in a good parent way. So um, it shouldn't come across as tyrannical, but once again, it takes her to both her opposing and her witch. And um, so what does she say? Private schools cost money. The first thing that comes up for her, that introverted sensing thing, money, you know, she's clutched about money. If we have introverted sensing in shadow or even in the inferior function, we have a little sensitivity around money issues. And then she says this very negative thing. I can't just put him in a private school, put him in and take him out on every passing whim of yours, which is such a, a negative response to a very generous offer, really. But of course, she's right too. I mean, we see how they're both coming from their own perspective. Neither one is wrong. But what happens is the energy in the unconscious takes over. So then what does he say? So I'll pay, which is phenomenal. But this is also the very first time that he has talked about the future with her. He has avoided anything. Typically, ISTJ didn't want anything to do with the future. Jung said that um, introverted sensing types have this very archaic uh, extroverted intuition where anything that is connected with future possibilities is dark and shadowy and um, scary. And so this is the first time he's ever done this. He's talking about the future with her. But look at where her anima function is. Her anima function is introverted intuition. So it's oppositional. If you can look at these, these they have functions. Their functions are oppositional all the way down. This is called a dynamic opposite pairing. There's a lot of attraction, but there's also repulsion. So this takes her to her introverted intuition function, which introverted intuition is, it doesn't want a variety of imaginative possible futures. It wants the best future. It seeks the best future. So she says, and it also, it thinks in images, whereas extroverted intuition is often verbal Introverted intuition usually comes in the form of visions and images. And so what does she say? And it's her soul function. Tell me, Megan, do you picture us getting married? Um, so she's got the word picture there. It's the vision that she has. And look at where he has introverted intuition. He's got a way down in the least conscious position the demonic position. It's so unconscious for him, he can't even summon an answer. He's like uh, beyond speechless. It's like marriages, I don't know. And he, he, you know, he can't, he doesn't know what to think. He doesn't know how to even picture it or go there. So then this takes her to her demonic because the archetypes are fields. So whenever one person is coming from an archetypal field, it takes 
the other person to that same archetype. And so now she's in her demonic and her demonic is extroverted intuition, which is all about imagined possibilities. But when it's in shadow, it's negative. So then she comes out with this incredible statement. She says, you don't, do you? You don't know. One minute you like me, the next minute you don't. I mean, she goes through this whole litany of possibility, negative possibilities. One minute you think I'm the best thing that ever happened to me. The next minute you're ashamed to be seen with me. Maybe tomorrow you'll be here. Maybe you won't. Or maybe you'll just go on back to Sarah, his, his ex-wife. And she kind of gives him a look at that point. <laughs> so he goes, I just want him to learn how to subtract. But what happens here, and this is actually very positive. Like I say, it's very positive to have an argument in a relationship. Um, but but it is important for us to try to be careful. I, she needed, of course, to let him know that she wants to get married. And he needed to let her know that he doesn't want to get married. So he's afraid of it. And somehow they needed to bring this out in the ocean and this in the open, this is what partnerships are good for and families are good for this, that we have to vent some of our unconscious feelings. And the only safe place to do it is with people who love us and whom we love. And so by doing that, we avoid some huge explosion on the workplace or, you know, um, in some other inappropriate place. Um, so you see people who are, who don't have a family or who are alone, they do have these, can have these buildups of emotion if they're not, unless they're very highly individuated, like the Dalai Lama, but of course he has his community of monks too. So, but what happens here when she says this, this last thing, Maybe you'll just go on back to Sarah. This had never occurred to him. Until that point, it had never occurred to him that it was even a possibility. And she has planted the seed in his mind now. And so I won't tell you what happens in the movie. It's a really great movie um, because it's wonderful. It shows how actually all both of these people become very individuated but um it does plant the seed in his mind so we do have to kind of be careful when we're when we're doing this and it does call for us sometimes to apologize afterwards and say i'm really sorry i didn't mean that you know you know whatever so that's just that's all i wanted to share yeah, within that small clip, you're able to get so much value out of it and so much meaning and substance. So I think that that's really illustrative of how we can try to communicate something very simple to our partner, but it goes through a rung of different functions or miscommunications, and then it ends up at this worst case scenario at the extroverted intuition for the ESTP. It was all just because he wanted her son to be able to subtract. So <laughs> it, it, it's just funny how human communication works. And I believe that most human communication or most fighting that happens in relationships is miscommunication. And so the eight function model is such a good way of figuring out how you're miscommunicating with your loved ones. Because if you are in a relationship with each other, you're gonna want it to work out. There's a part of you that definitely does. And so sometimes when we fight with our partner, we might assume, are they trying to irritate us on purpose? And usually that's not the case. And it's usually some sort of something gets lost in translation. And so the eight function model is a great way of figuring out what exactly was lost in translation. Mm -hmm. And so thank you, Carol, for your enlightening presentation. You're welcome. Thank and so you. feel free to check out her book. It is linked below. And so thanks everyone for watching. We'll see you all in the next one. Take care. Bye. Mm -hmm.